feel right now about the seriousness of this moment that we find ourselves in. I see a lot of your heads nodding as I say that. I saw your heads nodding when Jessica was speaking. Um, I see that manifest itself every day, uh, including right here today when I showed up. Usually it's in the morning when I'm leaving the house. And my wife, who I've been with since the ninth grade, we, we didn't get married in the ninth grade, but we didn't get married in the ninth grade, literally like pokes at me and says, you have to win, right? And many of you said that here today, not like, hey, good luck, we're with you, but like, you have to win. And I get that. Like, I really do understand where, where that's coming from. Right. Because we're in a moment right now of real worry. We're in a moment right now where we feel like those rights that we sort of have relied upon our whole lives are, are being ripped away from us. Um, I feel that as a dad with a 20-year-old daughter who I just feel guilty that she's growing up in a world now where for the first time in, in decades, a right was taken away from her and right. so many others, obviously, in this commonwealth and in this country. And I'm running for governor not just to win an election, but meet this moment and push back on that and make it so y'all don't have to point in my chest <laughs> and say you have to win. Um, you know, folks ask me a lot, why do you do this, right? Why do you do what you do? And in part, it is because um, of our four children, of our Sophia, our Jonah, our Max, and our Ruben, who go to school with, with your kids and used to go to school with yours. Here. And I look in their eyes every day and I worry about their future. I worry about rights being stripped away from them. I worry that they're going to grow up in a world where they can't marry who they love, or where they can't be able to govern decisions over their own body. I worry that they're going to grow up in a world where they won't get to choose the course of our democracy, but somebody's going to choose it for them. I worry about their planet, and I worry about their safety, yeah. and I worry about your kids and grandkids as well. I also do what I do because of my faith. And I realize we may not all share the same faith as some of us do. I'm not here to preach at you or tell you what to believe or to believe at all. But my faith teaches me that no one is required to complete the task, but neither are we free to refrain from it. What that means to me is that each of us has a responsibility to get off the sidelines, to get in the game, and to do our part. So yeah, my part is running for governor. And your part, of course, is to be here to help us, which I'm grateful for, but to be active and engaged citizens in a time where we need that so much, where we need people to be off the sidelines and in the game. And I believe, and I think a lot of others do too, that this governor's race is not just the most pivotal, I think, in Pennsylvania's modern history, but arguably one of the most pivotal races in our nation, just given who we're up I see this race being a referendum on opportunity and freedom. An opportunity to build a school system where every kid gets a shot. Every kid. Where we stop relying on standardized testing as a means to measure our kids and teachers, and instead make sure every kid has access to learning about arts and culture and humanities. Yeah. And how about history and yeah. civics and as civics. well? Where, where music. And and science. Where yeah. every, every kid <laughs> isn't sort of fulfilling the dreams of some bureaucrat in Paris, but fulfilling their own opportunities. That's why I want to put vocational, technical, and computer training yeah. in every single high school in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So if a kid wants to go to college, great. We're going to help make it more affordable. But if a kid wants to go work, we're going to show them a pathway to opportunity. Mm -hmm. Where we build a school system, a school system that respects every single child for their own beauty and their own wonder and not making decisions about kids out of some arbitrary bullying, frankly, that the adults are doing right now. Making sure every single kid when they go to school has access to a mental health counselor in their school building. That's an opportunity I see to yeah, build a quality yeah. education. Safe. Of course, we also have an opportunity to build safe communities. We've got to make sure that every single person is able to both be safe and feel safe 
in their community. That includes hiring more police, but also making sure that they're trained effectively so that when they see people who may look different than them, they see the humanity in those communities as well. We have an opportunity to build an economy that actually lifts everybody up. Now, y'all are, are pretty blessed. You have access to the internet. We still have so many people who don't have access to the internet, which makes it harder to have good health outcomes, good education outcomes, good economic outcomes. You gotta connect people to the internet. You gotta put more money in apprenticeship programs and get people to work. We've actually gotta reduce our tax burden, particularly on businesses, and increase wages. We can do both of those things at the same time. So we have an opportunity here to both improve our schools, our public safety, and grow the economy. But we've also got an opportunity here in Pennsylvania that we can't let slip away by ensuring that our democracy is able to continue. And our democracy and our fundamental rights and freedoms are under attack right now by my opponent in this election. Look, elections are binary choices. So you got me, or you got the other guy. And the other guy, I think, has a real dangerous vision of where he wants to take the economy. Some of you have obviously heard of him. I can see you not. <laughs> this is a guy who doesn't respect, Jessica, all of our children. This is a guy who doesn't believe women should govern their own bodies. This is a guy who wants to sign a bill into law that not only bans abortion, but says there should be no exceptions not in the case of rape or incest, not if the woman's life or health is at risk. He wants to go a step further. He actually wants to jail doctors who perform those medical procedures. These life-saving medical procedures. He could not be more different than me on this issue. And if you want to think about the effect of that Dobbs decision, think of it this way. There's no longer a federal right anymore. This is going to be hammered out state by state. We can lament the fact that Roe is gone, or we can do something about it, and ensure that here in Pennsylvania, not only does abortion remain legal, but women get to continue to make decisions with, over their own bodies. And we know that this legislature, we know this legislature is going to put a bill on the desk of the next governor to ban abortion, and you know I will veto, and y'all can come to the veto sign, so. <laughs> <laughs> we will sign. Here's another clear distinction. Back in the 2020 election, y'all may remember, I, I went to court a few times, 43 <laughs> times, <in the> court, <laughs> when the former president, and his enabler, his backers, like my opponent, sued us. And they sued us first to make it harder for people to vote. Let's speak truth. They weren't trying to make it harder for people who look like me. They were trying to make it harder for black and brown Pennsylvanians to be able to cast their ballot. And then, after all the votes were cast, then what they did was they tried to make it harder for the will of the people to be respected, meaning they wanted to throw out certain votes. 43 times they took me to court. By the way, they went 0 and 43, I went 43 and 0. <laughs> as we watched the January 6th hearings, there was a conspiracy to not just overturn the election, but undermine our democracy. And if you've watched these hearings, mm -hmm. one name that keeps coming up is Doug Mastriano, my opponent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not just because he was there that day, but because of his efforts to try and undermine our democracy. And I think it's important for you to know that while I was preparing to go to court yet again to defend our democracy, he was in D.C. on January 6th. Yeah, yeah. And he was not some passive observer. Understand, he bust people down. He marched to the Capitol. And when the police officers put up a steel barricade in front of the mob he was with, the mob ripped that out of the hands of that officer, cast the officer in the barricade aside. And when the police said stop, he kept marching up the step, videotaping the whole thing. Yep. Has to turn that over to the FBI. This is the guy who wants to be our governor. Understand that police died that day. 
They were mauled that day. They suffered permanent injuries that day. I've been to three police officer funerals in the last four months in Pennsylvania. Two in Philly, one in Lebanon City. I still talk to the widows that were left behind, and there were widows and affected families left behind because of the actions of Doug Mastriano and the other rioters. He wants to be the governor who's in charge of the state police. <coughs> Yet when the police said stop, he kept marching. He is unfit to be the chief executive. Yeah. Yeah. about freedom and defending our fundamental freedom. And this guy, by the way, loves to talk a good game about freedom. He loves to, you know, cloak himself in the blanket of freedom every day. But what he's selling is not freedom. What all of you are for is real freedom. Think about this for a minute. It's not freedom when you tell a woman what she can do with her body. That's not freedom. It's not freedom when you tell my kids and your kids what books they're allowed to read. That's not freedom. No. It's not freedom when you tell someone they're allowed to work, but they can't be a member of the union. And it sure as hell isn't freedom when he says, you can go vote, but he'll pick the winner. That's not freedom. Real freedom comes when we empower the next generation of young people through a school system that allows them to go out and develop companies and products that help save lives and do good things. That's real freedom. Real freedom comes when we go to the polls and vote for someone and people respect the choice of the elected. That's real freedom. Real freedom comes when we connected that person to the internet, and as a result of that, their farming operation grew to a level that allowed them to put food on their table and care for their family and get out of poverty. That's real freedom. That's what I see as a future of this conference. And I want you to know that while my name may be on the ballot, the truth is it's your rights and your future that's on the line. The good news is you all have the power. You have a real power to make a difference here. And I just wanted to come here today and ask you to you. It's not good enough, respectful, to just write a check today and move on. And I'm profoundly grateful to all of you for your generosity. I'm especially grateful to my friend, Janie, who's been there for me on so many steps. <laughs> but the check you write can't be the end of our conversation. You live in the swingiest of swing states, <laughs> right? Where we know this election is going to be close. Yeah. I hope it's not, but it probably will be. We know that because, heck, Look at our last two presidential races. One came down to 44,000 votes, the other came down to 80,000 votes. That's less than 1% of the electors at the time. Think about it. It's not a stretch to imagine this election, where it's all on the line, could come down to 50, 60, 40,000 votes. And now consider your power in this process. The power you have, not just with the check you wrote today, or the vote you'll cast on November 8th, or maybe before that if you vote by mail. But the power you have when you put a lawn sign on your lawn and say to the people who live around you, here in Lake Naomi or back wherever, wherever your more permanent homes are, you send a message to your neighbor that you're informed, you study the candidates, you know what's up, you decide with Shapiro and his value. Mm -hmm. That lawn sign is power. The conversation you have when you're leaving school or church, the conversations that you're having at the checkout counter or the carpool line, the conversations that you have at the club, those one-on-one -on -one conversations, that's what's going to win this election. The posts you have on Facebook, the organizing you're doing organically. We have some doctors for Shapiro who are here to push back and make sure that the truth is told in this election. You have immense power. And as I said before in citing my scripture, I would respectfully say you have a responsibility. Yes. You have a responsibility because I believe that's what's taught to you. I also think you have a responsibility because you're in Pennsylvania. Because this is the birthplace 
of our democracy, albeit a few miles down the road, but it was born here, <laughs> and it is being threatened. And anybody who thinks that's hyperbole, you're wrong. This is a real serious threat and risk. And this governor's race is going to determine whether that 246-year-old experiment began in the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection is going to continue here in Pennsylvania and continue across the country. If we do not win this, and rights are taken from us, and elections are rigged, and the will of the people is disrespected, we will not be able to turn back. No, that's right. It's good. It is all on the line. Mm -hmm. yep. I am working my tail off, and I'm profoundly grateful that you're out working for me. Y'all have the right to keep pointing my chest and telling me I gotta win. I know we're in this together. But I need you to be off the sidelines in the game, yeah. doing your part, spreading the word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna say thank you to everyone. To yeah. our